What is up, theology nerds? This is Trip. You're listening to Homebrewed Christianity, the number one source for audiological ingredients for your theological reflection right here on the interweb into your earbuds. And today on the podcast, the friend of Keith Ward, Dr. David Wilkinson, principal of St. John's College at the University of Durham in the UK, and he has not one but two PhDs. He has one in theoretical astrophysics, obviously, and systematic theology. Um, and, and today on the podcast, we're going to be talking about a whole host of different science and religion issues. He's going to give a fascinatingly clear explanation of the shift from Newton's vision of the world to the one that that, that emerges through kind of a quantum mechanics and special relativity. He's going to tackle questions around uh, the problem of evil. He's going to hear me vent about the multiverse and then help a, 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 me understand it and explain it to me. We're going to talk about science, religion, and extraterrestrial intelligence. Mm-hmm. We're going to talk about fine tuning. We're going to talk about uh, his preference for Star Wars over Star Trek. He's going to give a shout out to John Polkinghorne. Um, and, and then we're going to talk about uh, prayer and the way our metaphysical picture of the world impacts and sets us up for experience in the world in the sacred and different ways. Um, and then by the end, you know, we're going to talk about cultivating humility and awe and that science is a great place uh, to help us do it and that the church should be fully embracing of the scientific quest and search for truth in any quadrant of our experience with reality. So, yeah, it's going to be exciting. Uh, before we jump in, I want to remind you of a few things coming up. One, this Thursday, the 29th of August in the year 2019, Robin Henderson Espinosa and I are doing the Homebrewed Book Club this month. We're reading Identity by Francis Fukuyama. Um, if you are a member of the Homebrewed community, like you went to homebrewedcommunity.com, and signed up, then you will get an invitation the day before to join live. You will, if you're a homebrew deacon or above on the membership group, you'll get the recorded thing sent to you in our brand new members podcast feed. That's right. The members have their own podcast. That's what I'm talking about. This is a brand new thing. Exciting. Um, also, uh, we will be sending you uh, info on joining the first live lecture for the intro to theology class. Yeah. So if you want to figure out what it is, all the different guests here uh, kind of assume is common knowledge, the different schools of thought and thinkers and the way theologians shape and wrestle with different doctrines and such. I'm going to be doing for um, the members a class that introduces all those things. Uh, so check it out. Go to the Homebrew Community um, page and, and and join join all the cool people who are supporting the podcast and such. Like uh, brand new brand new members, people like Everett Reed, Clayton, Christopher, Curtis, Love, Andrew, Pars, Stephen, George, Dion, Blake, Josh, Trey. All of them, just in the last week since the last episode, have become Homebrewed Christianity members. Well done, friends. Well done. They're anxiously anticipating the book group this week and the kickoff uh, to the uh, systematic theology. They're also helping me, um, you know, in my family's transition to uh, Scotland. So, yeah, if you want to learn more about that, go to the special announcement episode. I'm moving to Scotland, taking a post at the University of Edinburgh. And um, uh, it costs a lot of money to move there. And the podcast is making the whole thing possible because um, I'm able to take uh, the position and still afford to feed the family and move across the country. That's pretty amazing. Not across the country, across an ocean. What am I talking about? It's a different continent. Yeah. Also, if you are a homebrewed member or a regular listener in Europe, holler at me because I'm going to be there now and I'm going to be looking for things to do, you know? All right. There are two events that before I leave the United States, I want to let you know about. And the 20th, and the 21st of September, I'll be in Indianapolis. You would just go to the website and click the events page on homebrewedchristianity.com or tripfuller.com, either one. Um, uh, on the 20th and 21st, I'll be in Indianapolis. There's a number of different events. They're all free. You can go to all of them or one of them. And then on the 27th and 28th of September, I will be 
in Cary, North Carolina, which is Raleigh Durham uh, area, uh, with Robin Henderson Espinoza, mm-hmm. Brian McLaren, Steve Davidson. We have got a uh, it, it, it's it's going to be exciting. And and here's how the event's built. It's called called to be prophets. The first day um, up until dinner is really geared towards community leaders. And all the challenges you have addressing different prophetic challenges. How do you connect the prophetic imagination of the Hebrew people uh, to our contemporary situations around issues of uh, economics, ecology, racism, things like that? Right? That's what is taking place um, for faith leaders, community leaders, community organizers and such. Then there's like a fun, exciting live podcast at night. The next day, we're going to be tackling the issues, but in an interactive way with all the different speakers for a larger audience, lay leaders and things like that. People that are just interested and want to think about it. And then we're going to have a fun thing that night because Brian and Robin have new books out. All right. That's exciting. That's what I'm talking about. So go check it out. If you use my name, Trip with two Ps, you get a discount off your ticket. All right. Boom, shaka, laka, laka, laka. <laughs> so now prepare yourself for David Wilkinson and uh, I hope you enjoy it and thanks again for everybody that has already uh, donated to the GoFundMe for my family it means a ton and those of you that have joined um, the membership uh, group the homebrewed community uh, recently it's uh, yeah yeah. I don't, I don't want to get like heartfelt or anything that'd be awkward because some of you are trying to exercise or wash dishes so just uh insert whatever the appropriate thank you is at the level of emotional vulnerability you can handle and then till then you know share the group peace well hello everybody this is trip and today on the podcast is David Wilkinson, who is uh, a astrophysicist and a theologian. So uh, all the way from St. John's College in Durham. So how? Uh, thank you for hanging out across the internet and across the oceans. It's a pleasure trip. It's nice to be part of this. Well, you know, and and you're a uh, friend of Keith Ward. So people listening to the podcast have heard Keith on here a bunch of times, and Keith recommended you for the series on religion and science. And and I think uh, people probably heard the stories of a whole lot of people that ended up theologians. But how, as a person of faith, do you end up an astrophysicist? It's a good question. Let me say from the beginning that I'm not one of these um, uh, big bang nerds who began an interest in science at the age of four or anything like that. I didn't build a telescope at the age of seven. Uh, to be honest, I, I, I was... Not too bad at mathematics. And when it came mm-hmm. to university, I had a real passion. And that wasn't science, but that was cricket. And that's difficult to translate across the Atlantic. Um, and I wanted to find a, a subject where I could play a bit of cricket at the university and not spend endless hours researching and writing essays. And as I was pretty good at mathematics, physics was the one to do. Now, around that time, I'd just become a Christian, around the age of 17. And I think two things got me into science. The first was the science at university level is very different from high school. Uh, We began with quantum theory and special relativity, things that are quite mind-blowing in their own area. But secondly, as my Christian faith grew, so my interest in the natural order, the creation grew. Uh, Kepler once said, science is thinking God's thoughts after him. Mm -hmm. And so it was part of Christian discipleship that uh, encouraged me in my interest in science. And when you you first kind of hear those ideas of like quantum theory, special relativity, stuff like that in uh, the university, uh, what kind of... uh, what kind of baggage did those ideas have then culturally? Because now when people hear them and they're religious, I, I've heard almost every weird spiritual phenomena connected to uh, some type of physics. So d- did, the, did those concepts have the kind of cultural woo-woo attached to them at that point? 
No, not really. And that shows a little bit of my age. This was early in the 80s. There'd been a little bit of work on quantum theory and Eastern thought uh, with uh, Zukov and one or two others. But uh, very few Christian theologians had really engaged with some of these areas. What struck me, however, from the scientists who taught these areas was a sense of awe. Mm -hmm. And I remember the quantum theory uh, lecture, beginning his lecture series with uh, a word something like, uh, what a privilege it is for me to teach you such an awe-inspiring subject. Now, of course, as an 18-year-old undergraduate, at that point, you giggle with glee as you think to yourself, this is just a bit over-serious. But as time went on, there was this sense uh, of these are strange but absolutely fascinating scientific discoveries. As I say, um, this was pre uh, the work of people like John Polkinghorne, which were to bring quantum theories and relativity really to mainstream theology. Um, and this was in the days when nerds were not cool. So uh, to be a geek or a nerd uh, was very uncool indeed. And one didn't go to parties and entertain people with quantum theory. Uh, one kept quiet uh, and sometimes, uh, in answer to what do you do, would reply, well, actually, I'm an accountant rather than an astrophysicist. <laughs> so for for those that didn't end up uh, getting into kind of the high math versions of science, what what is it that we... Uh, presume about our world in kind of just a common sense way that when you start wrestling with physics, uh, goes out the window or gets reformulated or, or, or re, you know, looked at a completely different way? Yeah, two things with each of those subjects. So quantum theory particularly took the clockwork universe of Isaac Newton and really threw it out the window. Newton, or you remember, because uh, apparently he'd been hit by an apple uh, from a tree uh, while he was at home during the plague that hit Cambridge, had come up with a number of things. One was differential equations, which generations of 16 to 18-year-olds have cursed him for. One was um, his uh, theory of gravitation, his laws of motion. And this was a very neat way of describing the motion of the planets around the sun. And from that, we got a model, a model which was sometimes reconstructed as a physical model within Victorian dining rooms, which was a clockwork mechanism of uh, the planets arriving around the sun. But philosophically, a model which said that the universe is picturable and the universe is predictable. What quantum theory says is that the very smallest size of reality, protons, electrons, atoms, the universe is unpicturable. You cannot uh, picture it in everyday terms. And secondly, it's unpredictable. Now, we're still struggling, Trip, with the, um, the relationship of quantum theory's description of the world at the smallest level to our everyday Experience So um, there's an unpredictability of the atoms in my body to walk through the wall that's in front of me. Uh, but rarely will I try that experiment because I know that when atoms get together in such large quantities, <coughs> the unpredictability collapses out and the world becomes a more pre predictable place. But theologically and philosophically, the key is to say that that clockwork, predictable universe of Isaac Newton that said, for example, God can't intervene in the world because everything's predictable, or took away free will from human experience because everything's predictable, that is only a very small description of what reality's about. And so John Polkinghorne often says, um, quantum theory frees us from the tyranny of common sense. And there's something that I think that's very important for that and theologians. And then if we were to talk about relativity, that's where we start to think that time itself is far more slippery uh, 
than we ever thought it was. The time, it depends on how you're moving and where you are in the universe. And these absolutes, again, of Isaac Newton of time and space, are much more complicated and much more observer-dependent. And those are the things, I think, for me, uh, really transformed physics from actually something very boring mm -hmm. to something really quite alarming at times. Mm -hmm. So how does this kind of uh, new science change the the background or the philosophical set of frameworks for people of different religious traditions uh, to, to think through the kind of historic stories and doctrines and ideas of their faith? Well, let me give you one or two examples because that's such a profound question. One could never quite do the whole uh, answer to it. Um, but I think if we say that uh, if you look at the tradition within Christian biblical scholarship, part of the input into the 18th and 19th century was those who said from the Newtonian clockwork mechanism, miracles are not possible because God cannot intervene within a predictable clockwork universe. And indeed, part of the demythologization of the New Testament, those who said, well, the miracle stories are simply stories created by the early church rather than happened in the early church, um, was part of that legacy. I think now, at the very least, we can say that the motivation for that process of the clockwork universe was, at the very least, overstated. And therefore, I think there's ways of talking about God's action in the world, how God acts, which are much more open and much more fruitful than they were a century ago. Mm -hmm. um, I think when it comes to relativity and time, then issues such as how God relates to time becomes one of the um, one of the interesting areas. It's always been an interesting area for people of lots of different religious faiths, um, as if God was somehow above time, looking down on everything that happened before and after. One of the things we now know is that time is related to the three dimensions of space, and indeed in some of our models of the early universe, we believe not just in four dimensions of space-time, but we believe in 11 dimensions of space-time. Now, what might a universe look like if it had more than one dimension of time? What might it be if God existed in a much richer uh, set of space-time dimensions than just the four that we experience? Might that give the age-old solution to the problem of God being transcendent, greater than, but imminent, related to. Um, and for me as a Christian, that's an interesting model to develop in the sense that one of the things that strikes me about the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the way that Jesus, uh, as, as a risen uh, person, related to the material nature of the world, but didn't seem to be limited by the space-time of this world. Mm -hmm. And so these are the things that one can at least speculate about. I'm not claiming that these allow you to interpret the Scriptures in a completely different way or solve some of the age-old problems of theology. But I think they do stimulate the imagination in different ways to where we've been before. Do you think part of it is um, the that a human being, our relationship with the world, time, space, and everything around us has a relatively narrow scale, and so um, the way we the way we relate to the world, even if we can conceptualize different scales of relationship, is always with the average length of a human life, the average size of a body, uh, probably only in one or two ecosystems your entire life. And uh, then the whole way you interpret that narrow scale is with the language and stories of the tradition and culture and things you're born into. And one of the things about uh, particularly the harder the science, the more math is involved, uh, 
and the more investigation with stars and space is there's like some switch that has to flip for us to start thinking in a scale so unlike uh, normal human everyday existence. I think you're spot on there. I think that's a, um, um, one of the observations that really makes sense a great deal of this whole area. And that is our experience is very narrow. And a lovely example of that is in the philosophy of Immanuel Kant. Mm -hmm. So Kant, in trying to come to terms with how our minds uh, both receive sense data and characterize them, came to the conclusion that really um, our understanding of the world was largely a projection of the way that we categorize the world onto it. And uh, he made a prediction that space-time should be a certain type. In fact, he was totally wrong. And that was because he did exactly as you said. He took his everyday experience and said, that is normative for the whole of the universe. And we know that um, not just on the astronomical scale, but also as we go to the level of atoms, mm -hmm. If we're prepared to trust the language of mathematics, which often we have to do, because it's difficult sometimes uh, to take uh, analogies, metaphors from our everyday world and apply them to these very different places, we do see things in a different way. And just as, as I've seen the world in different ways by going to different cultures, so the different cultures of astronomy or of particle physics show me a world that's very different. And if I might just build on your point, often our imaging, our modeling of God is entirely dependent on our little bit of the narrow universe that we experience. Mm -hmm. So for those of us who are, are white and male, we tend to construct God in our own image. Um, and certainly from Newtonian science, God was constructed as the one who wound up the clock of the universe, the divine watchmaker. Um, and so we often not just talk about our own view of reality, but we also model God on this very small, narrow part of reality. Mm -hmm. So when you think of that, the image of God as watchmaker or any type of kind of deistic theism, um, you imagine God's relationship to the world as intelligent. So it's understandable. The world's understandable. You can read the natural laws and things, but God's ongoing relationship to the world is primarily set at its origin, right? And God can yeah. make the watch and leave it. And that sets up a very closed universe that's easy to right. account for in deterministic ways. And for God to be present and active, it requires a breaking of the natural order because the world and God are essentially separate and that's how God made it. Right. And I like, I feel like that, that like those ideas, even though we've kind of left that Newtonian world behind scientifically exists so much in the church Yes. That if we talk about a living and life-giving God, or if we talk about God in Christ, the incarnation for them, it, ha it has to be some breaking of everything for God yeah. to finally show up, as opposed to, I think, a more open or relational perspective of God in the world that uh, new cosmologies allowing, uh, allowing us to see we were flattening the universe and we flattened it so much through this Newtonian perspective that then the bottom dropped out and more mystery and awe is there than you can handle. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's interesting uh, in talking with fellow Christians, I'd have to say most are deists rather than theists because they've um, taken on board that God is creator means, the God who sets off the explosion of the Big Bang and then goes off for a cup of coffee, maybe he'll appear again on Judgment Day, but he's not going to do very much more. And you're right that we flattened the universe in such a way. Now, uh, I think, in fairness, part of that is that it's given some Christian theologians an easy way out of the problem of evil. Mm -hmm. Because a God who simply interacts with the universe at his very beginning and doesn't do anything else... 
then in some theologians' minds can't be blamed for the problem of evil. But the whole biblical story for me is of a God who is present and acts within the universe. Now, that opens me more to the problem of evil and its difficulty. But I think the overwhelming evidence, particularly of the incarnation and the resurrection, uh, is of a God who's involved and is acting within the universe. And that's why I think scripture is such an important part of the science-faith discussion. Mm -hmm. Because often in the past, uh, it's been a discussion between science and philosophy, Mm -hmm. uh, trying to, to work out a neat philosophical model. Scripture always comes into it. And, you know, as J.B. Phillips, another many years ago, wrote a little book called Your God is Too Small. And that's what Scripture does for me. It expands the nature of God's work and presence in the world. Mm -hmm. And when you think of the, the biblical testimony of a God present, living, and active... Um, and recognize the historicity of the texts themselves. Mm. How, how, as someone who um, is wrestling with our current historical scientific account of uh, of the universe, does that impact your looking back at the historical testimonies of God in the past and the you know the texts from the people of Israel in the early church? Yes, I mean, in a sense, I was drawn to the Christian faith in part because of that very point. And that was that I came to particularly the historicity around the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth uh, mm-hmm. as a scientist who wanted to say, um, how do I assess the evidence? Now, of course, uh, one of the things that I have to recognize is that we're often talking about unique events here. So the repeatability of science doesn't apply here. We're talking more about the way that a historian would sift the evidence. Mm -hmm. But the thing that's really helped me from science over the years is to recognize that I might have a theory which has evidence for and evidence against And as a scientist, part of the skill of science is to assess the weight of evidence for and the weight of evidence against. So I'm always sceptical if there's a case where there's only evidence for. I expect something to be there, and then you weigh the evidence for and against. When it comes, say, to claiming a God of love uh, and a God who allows certain types of evil, that's helped me over the years. I take seriously the fact that there's evil in the world. But the overwhelming weight of evidence, particularly in Jesus, of a God of love, um, uh, outweighs that. And the third thing that's helped me as a scientist is that I might have evidence for something that I don't fully understand. Mm -hmm. Now, if we were having this conversation back uh, at the turn of the 20th century, we would have an interesting problem because as a scientist, I would say to you, Trip, uh, I've got evidence for light as a particle and I've got evidence for light as a wave. And you would say, well, how, do the fit, how does that fit together? And I would say, I have no idea. But because I've got the evidence for it, I have to hold that light is both particle and wave. Now, 20 years later, in the 1920s, Paul Dirac, in a theory called quantum electrodynamics, came along and helped me out to Mm -hmm. understand how uh, light was both particle and wave. But before that, I simply had to say, I don't understand, but on the basis of the evidence, that's what I hold. So when it comes to the resurrection of Jesus, I can't, as a scientist, explain the resurrection of Jesus. Mm -hmm. But what I can do is look at the evidence for it um, and against it, and I can be convinced that something that, even though I can't fully explain it, uh, is something that happened. Um, And so in those ways, it's helped me a little bit with uh, how to uh, 
uh, look at history. Mm-hmm. And and I imagine like the as someone invested scientifically, just the kind of bigger cosmology you have in the back of your mind impacts what the how you interpret evidence for and against things, right? Like yes, it does. Because I one of the things I'm always struck by in talking about issues of divine action. Um, especially in congregation settings where I'm guest speaking, is how many of them basically function like uh, Hume's treatise on miracles is gospel. Yes. And yes. Um, and so those are the assumptions running in their head, which yes. if that's the universe and if those are the grounds for arguing it, then, um, y- you know, there is no type of hearing you're going to get. That's right. Um, and so I, I'm thinking of as a physicist, some of the some of the elements just within your own field that uh, how you relate to it and your own experience with God and stuff would change how you interpret it. It's like something like fine tuning. Could you kind of describe ha- describe that scientifically and why people that do have experiences of faith would interpret that evidence differently than someone uh, who who doesn't? Yes, absolutely. Let me just. Um, pick up the Hume comment, which I think yeah. again I agree uh, completely on, and that is that um, uh, Hume is a philosophy a philosopher of science, and often uh, philosophers of science aren't as good as scientists themselves. So, for instance, when I look at the Big Bang, do I have direct experience of the Big Bang? No, of course I don't. The evidence that I uh, accumulate is from the testimony of satellites and other scientists whole number of other things. So I've got something which is about the complexity of science going on. But let me go to fine-tuning, or what Paul Davis often calls uh, the Goldilocks enigma, and it's a nice way of putting it, that the universe is just right in terms of certain law and circumstance that allow intelligent human beings to evolve and be stable within the universe. And over the last 40 years at least, we've discovered a whole number of these balances that if the laws were just slightly different, you and I wouldn't exist. Now, I think as Sir Martin Rees, the current British astronomer royal, rightly points out, Lord Rees as he is now, um, there are really three options to interpret this. The first is to say, well, that's interesting, but... That's the way it is. Um, uh, Reese says um, uh, that's just not satisfying for most scientists. Um, if something is so extraordinary, and some of these Goldilocks enigmas are so extraordinary, it, you can't really go through life simply saying, I'm not going to think about it, because uh, they raise the question of whether there's a deeper story to the universe. That leaves uh, Reese with two other options. One is God did it. God provided the fine-tuning. And the second is uh, that we are one universe in a multitude of universes, a multiverse. Now, Reese's own preference is for a multiverse. My preference, of course, is that the breast interpretation uh, of fine-tuning is that God set up the universe in this way. But I want to take Reese's point seriously because what multiverse does, and there's lots of different theories of multiverse, um, but what multiverse does is it provides a philosophical alternative to the claim that this is a creation of God. Now, that means for me that fine-tuning or the Goldilocks enigma is an invitation to a deeper conversation rather than a proof Mm -hmm. of the existence of God. I don't think we go back to the design argument here and try and prove God because multiverse exists as a possible alternative to the linear explanation that God did it. And so, but however, that's not to throw away the extraordinary Uh, nature of the universe which is fine-tuned and to say is a better overall philosophical interpretation 
once you take into account not just fine-tuning but the origin of the universe and indeed you take into account the history around Jesus of Nazareth. For me, that overall interpretation is that the best interpretation of fine-tuning is that God created the universe in this way. But I don't want to prove God. Mm -hmm. I simply want to say this may be a pointer to God. Mm -hmm. And and one of the things, and uh, I'm not a scientist, and since finishing my PhD, I've started reading a lot of it just because it's fun. Uh, But one of the things I can't figure out about the multiverse, and you might be able to help me here, is... um, it seems to presume that all the possibilities of math, uh, certain mathematical models have to be actualities. Yes. And that type of relationship between math and reality seems philosophically just problematic to me on for lots of reasons. And I, I was wondering if, uh, because it's in a sense, the, mul- the, the math you use to understand um uh the kind of goldilocks enigma the way the constants work in our universe has certain types of abstracted mathematical debris and then you're saying oh all these poss- possibilities are there are actual but that's not how we use math when doing science for plenty of other things um yeah, at least this is this is trips uh question when looking at my friends that are physicists that are very insistent about the multiverse i'm like i read what you said and here's what comes to my head but uh you know I, I, my natural intuition isn't to look at the universe uh, and and not narrate it in a way where there's a creative, uh, a sh- a structured advance towards life. So I realize my own kind of intuitions are to read against it. Sure, I, and I have great sympathy with you on that. I mean, the first thing to say is that there are different multiverse theories. So... Um, uh, a theory which says that our universe is one bubble universe amongst many which are expanding and just because our universe has the right constants in it, it expands to a point where life is possible, does not say that there are an infinite number of universes. And I think there's philosophically, um, as you rightly say, there is a problem with saying that not every possibility is actualized. However, there is a second interpretation, which uh, is an interpretation which comes from quantum mechanics. And that is the interpretation um, of Hugh Everett III, who said that every quantum event, which has different probabilities, is fulfilled in different universes. Mm-hmm. And the universe bifurcates at that point. Now, the trouble is that as you and I talk, the very technology by which we're talking is creating uh, millions, billions, 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 billions of quantum events. Um, if ever it is right and every possibility is fulfilled, then, um, I mean, it's not exactly Occam's razor, to be honest. You get... Uh, this extraordinary uh, universe where every possibility is fulfilled so that just as you and I are talking, a pink elephant descends on my head in a universe far away. And I just don't think that um, that's helpful. Now, this is why Christian theology, I think, does become helpful. Because... Certainly when Christian theologians began to talk about the size of the universe and other worlds, what they said was not every possibility is fulfilled. They said it's God's action that actualizes certain possibilities. And so we have a, we have a finite universe by the nature of God's self-expression of creativity. Mm-hmm. And I think, uh, I think although we might use some of the mathematics of infinity and all the rest of it uh, to do some of our equations, uh, I much prefer that the universe uh, doesn't 
realize every possibility or i think the consequences are just beyond uh, any uh, reason for believing it mm -hmm. so when you when you hear contemporary debates around uh creation um and not like the doctrine of creation but um like uh, science, scientific debates like Lawrence Krauss' book on creation out of nothing to um, kind of p at least uh, Big Bang cosmology not being um, you know completely dominant. Uh, how how do you how do you describe what's going on when philosophers debate the origins of our particular space time and that relationship to what as a theologian you talk about when we say God is creator? Yes. Um, I mean, uh, famously, Stephen Hawking in um, The Grand Design says philosophy is dead in talking about such things. And I wouldn't go that far. Uh, what, f what does frustrate me, I have to say, about certain philosophers is their lack of sp specific knowledge of the fundamental physics. And this becomes important in discussions about the origin of time or space. So, for example, um, the cosmological argument in temporal form, long used by philosophers, which is basically there's cause and effect in the universe, and the universe is an effect, what is the cause? There must be God in this long temporal sequence back. Um, I think Hawkins' uh, view that the universe... Uh, simply appears spontaneously as a quantum event and just buries that in the mud. I think then you can come back with a cosmological argument which is much more uh, helpful, which is uh, where do the laws of physics themselves come from that mm -hmm. provides quantum theory. So in many ways, I welcome the physics in order to correct the inadequate uh, philosophy or theology. This is where I think I'm thankful for, for Professor Hawking and others for pushing these arguments in a way that sometimes in the past philosophers and theologians haven't done. I think we also have a problem with um, a number of philosophers who are scientific illiterate and a number of scientists who are philosophically illiterate and a part of some of the things that one or two of us are attempting to do in projects that we're involved in today is to try and help a little more dialogue go on so that under, uh, philosophers and theologians and physicists can actually understand the language that we talk about um, and that's not easy. Uh, so certain schools of philosophy will say that quarks don't exist. They're just figments of our construction of the universe. Now say that to a typical physicist uh, who's spent their lives modelling uh, how quarks make up protons and neutrons and firing protons against each other and electrons through protons and all the rest of it, and look at the scattering. Um, uh, now, we might want to talk a bit more about reality, but that's not the best thing to say to a physicist. Um, I think part of what we need to do is to take each other's languages seriously and to understand them on their own terms. Um, and that's where I think we've got quite a bit more work to do. Mm-hmm. So as someone who is um, also uh, a minister in the church, uh, where are the places you see um, faith not taken seriously in the academy? Um, because I, I think that uh, in the that oftentimes people are so familiar with kind of one form of discourse and can recognize when it's not being taken seriously, but then haven't done the work to not bear false witness, false witness against uh, their neighbor and the types of discourse that shape and form them. 
Yes. Uh, I think in terms of my situation here on this side of the Atlantic, the question is slightly different. And that is that I see increasingly faith being taken seriously in the academy. I think we went through a phase in British uh, academies where the wave of secularization um, rather overtook um, uh, the discussion of faith in the public square. Um, But it probably went too far. So the attack of new atheism, and particularly uh, Dawkins' uh, God delusion, probably went too far in its attack. Um, And the claim that what has theology ever given us to the modern university? Well, I think now with some careful work by historians, we now know, for example, that it was Christian theology that laid the foundations for much of modern science. Mm -hmm. It was Christian theology that laid the foundations for much of English law. Um, you can't really understand Shakespeare without uh, some biblical and faith literacy. And certainly as we've begun to see that that atheism has not simply taken faith out of human geography or anthropology or sociology, uh, that we now are dealing with faith as a major geopolitical force for both good and evil. Mm-hmm. I find the academy again wanting to take faith seriously. And even within science, which, you know, um, uh, it was Thomas Henry Huxley in the 19th century who wanted to separate faith from science. He did so by creating this conflict model between science and faith. What we're now discovering is that science itself is reaching those questions which itself it cannot answer and is asking faith to help it, obviously in areas of ethics, in artificial intelligence, the growth of genetic engineering. A number of scientists, uh, friends of mine, who wouldn't be called people of faith, are saying we need to engage with faith communities. In the teaching of science, we now know that um, a great deal of the teaching of science is dependent on where students start from, what their inner faith commitments are like. And the public appreciation of science or how it assesses it. You know, my, uh, a friend of ours in geography the other day did a very interesting thing. He asked, um, uh, why are people sceptical about scientific advances? And he took nanotechnology and he took a number of um, focus groups where he asked the question, are you fearful of nanotechnology taking over the world? And then he analysed the responses. And the responses that he got was that much of people's fear about new scientific advances uh, are entirely dependent on Greek myths, Pandora's box. You open it, you can't close it. Uh, We don't meddle in the realm of the gods. And he pointed out that actually if we had a much more Judeo-Christian view of science as gift, we would have a much more healthier engagement with science in the public sphere. So I think in lots of these ways, I'm quite uh, positive about faith within the academy um, across all subjects. Mm -hmm. So in uh, one of your books I I was reading this week, Science, Religion, and the Search for uh, Extraterrestrial Intelligence, Uh, one of the reasons that topic is so exciting is just because it it brings together, uh, you know, a lot of big religious and philosophical questions, science, science fiction imagination, and that whole cultural question of, you know, have we been visited or not and things like that. I feel like... Um, there's so many different intersections around thinking of extraterrestrial intelligence of interest that it's a real fruitful place that doesn't have all the boundaries and baggage to start a conversation around religion and science. And, so maybe you can tell us your own kind of avenue to 
you know, coming to write a really fun read that introduces lots of different topics and science stuff. But like when was it, was it the X-Files TV show or, um, or, or, or something super nerdy? Well, no, I'm super nerdy. So, uh, I'm Star Wars, uh, first and foremost, although I do appreciate Star Trek as well. Um, I think secondly, the science is just fantastic at the moment. It's really one of the most wonderful, um, areas that we're working in, how you find planets around other stars. And some of the technology and work on that has been fantastic. I think thirdly, it's the area that people often ask me about, Trip. If we did discover extraterrestrial intelligence, what would that mean for Christian faith? Um, But I think it's also interesting, I, I say this cautiously, in that I think it's a sand pit for theology, by which I mean you can do some theological speculation in a way that isn't as sensitive concerning other questions. Now, in the 20th century, it's interesting that many Roman Catholic writers were fascinated by the question of extraterrestrial intelligence. And I think part of the reason for that was it allowed them to ask questions of, who was saved outside of the church without having to mention Protestants. So they could talk about aliens and whether there was salvation beyond the church without having to engage in the more sensitive areas. I think for us, uh, there are questions about incarnation, redemption, uh, about who is saved, um, which actually translate into questions of our neighbours who are of different faiths. But we can ask them in a very speculative form within the area of of aliens and SETI um, and explore the theology at some depth without without being always um, uh, sensitive to the very important questions of who is my neighbour and how do I uh, live as a Christian who respects the beliefs of other faiths, learns from the beliefs of other faiths, and yet uh, holds that Jesus is Lord. So I think think for a whole number of reasons, the science fiction stuff, the, the science itself, the theological questions, the apologetic questions, but also this ability for us to do some theological speculation. It's a wonderful thing to do. But also, you know, as I try and say in the book, is that Christians from the very earliest days have been at the forefront of speculation about other life on other planets um, because they've been convinced that if God is free to create, God can do whatever he wants to do. And the only way that we would know what he's done is to train our telescopes and try and figure it out. And when when you when you start in the book, you kind of uh, give an overview of the scientific journey to questing for other other life. Like, how would you kind of outline the the progress we've made at becoming more more confident or more optimistic that there is uh, extraterrestrial intelligence? It's almost been a a one step forward and a one step back Mm -hmm. journey in that um, various discoveries we've made have encouraged us to believe that we're not alone. The size of the universe, for example, the fact that probably 60 or 70 percent of stars have their own planetary systems, the fact that we're discovering planets around other stars that are about the right temperature for life to develop. All of those things have pushed us towards optimism. But at the same time, what we've discovered through biology particularly is that in order to develop intelligent, self-conscious beings, the environment has to be just right for that to happen. And so as I talk to physicists, they're very keen on extraterrestrial intelligence. When I talk to biologists, they're more skeptical 
about in, uh, into uh, intelligence in other places. So I think uh, it's it's a it's an area of science where you have competing scientific uh, arguments, and I think part of what the general public needs to know and what theologians need to develop is a sense of how you weigh the evidence. So um, there is no absolute answer at the moment. You've got to weigh the evidence that you have and come to some kind of conclusion. Um, And for what it's worth, for me at the moment, the evidence is that we're probably alone as intelligent life in this galaxy. And that's not to say that there might be lots of bacteria out there. Mm -hmm. Trouble is, that's not very interesting for Star Trek fans to simply go and discover even more bacteria. Um, But there might be intelligent life in other galaxies. But from that point of view, that's also got a challenge because communication is a real difficulty with other galaxies. It could be a very long conversation of us waiting for a response to some of our questions. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, yeah, the, the speed of light really does, uh, it is buffer buffer that conversation. It's worse than dial up internet. Absolutely. Absolutely. So how much of the, how much of the debate, and you talk about in the book about, how you really the theories around the origin of life itself and the trajectories of a biological evolution. So well, one of the, and I think that's an important thing to get because um, you know we have a lot of access to how that trajectory and the evolution of life and thing has worked on our own planet, but it's not like we have multiple petri dishes to go check out. Exactly. And uh, all of our discussion in this area at the moment is characterized by uh, our view of life being human dependent. This is part of why it would be so exciting even to find some microbes on Mars to see if the basic biochemistry might be the same as human life. And so a lot of our speculation in this area is tinged with uh, anthropomorphism. Mm -hmm. There's, it's a bit like ours. Now, of course, uh, in the classic Star Trek line, which wasn't in the series itself, uh, but uh, it's life, Jim, but not as we know it, um, opens the door of other forms of life. The difficulty with that is you can keep speculating uh, and keep speculating uh, might life be um, uh, transformers who change from robots into small cars? Might life be um, so such small uh, two-dimensional beings in the atmosphere of Jupiter that we might never find a way of, of communicating with them? So the only thing we can do is to start from ourselves and to say, that may be characteristic of life. Now, there is a little bit of evidence to help us with this. And that's the work of people like Simon Conway Morris Mm -hmm. and others, the Cambridge paleontologist, who points out that in evolution, there are what he calls convergences. That wherever you start in evolution, you often end up with certain types of patterns So the eye has evolved over 40 times Mm. within evolutionary theory separately, by which I mean it has a different tree or branch leading to the eye. It might be that human-like intelligence is a convergence in evolution, that actually on a different planet you might start in a different kind of way, but ultimately you might end up with a Star Trek type universe where people can all talk to each other, at least through a universal translator, that is, or have some similarity with each other. So if you if you are um, you know, getting together a bunch of theologians to have 
play in the sandbox of the stars. Uh, what are the what are a couple questions that you want to make sure are on the agenda so we can use uh, the question around extraterrestrial intelligence to to think through uh, questions that the church is uh, needing uh, to wrestle with today? Yes, yeah, is a very good question, and I think uh, the number one question would be. Uh, what is the nature and the universality of the Jesus event? So um, particularly uh, the nature of the redemptive work of the cross, um, how does that relate to the rest of the universe? Not just in terms of aliens, but indeed the whole of the created order. So is it the case that the uh, crucifixion of Jesus is a once-for-all event for the whole universe. Mm -hmm. The consequence of which, unfortunately, is that Christians then become have to become cosmic missionaries, taking the gospel to the ends of the universe, and that's a very long journey. Or is it the case that um, incarnation and redemption happens on different planets with little green women and little green men? in a form appropriate to them. So the concept of multiple incarnations. Now, I think um, that is a very important question in terms of our relationship with other faiths, the particularity of the Christian claim of certain events and certain actions. I think it's very important in teasing out within within the action of Jesus, the relationship between revelation and salvation. So what we know of of Jesus is a God who came into a sinful world to show us God's love, but at the same time to save us. And if you know anything of the, of the science fiction of C.S. Lewis, you'll know that Lewis plays a little bit with might there be a race which is sinless? Now, do you need an incarnation, a God becoming flesh, if you have a sinless civilization? So I think that's the number one question, um, is really about the universality of the Jesus event. And what's crazy about that uh, that conversation is that actually reopens some of the earliest theological debates that we had, yes. right? Like if you, it, you could just as easily pull origin and Tertullian and Irenaeus out and they'll all have different answers again to this question. But you can see that from early on, there was always this is like, uh, is, is the salvation event in the early church, the cross and resurrection, or is it the incarnation, the infinite becoming finite? And uh, and then anyway, like to me, there's a uh, it is a lot of fun, and you know, having worked in churches for a long time, I can guarantee you, people are or will get energized about it when you bring up aliens. Yes. But if you're like, um, so in the early church, there are kind of three yeah. large schools of thought. They're like, what uh, trip? I'm busy. Yeah. I don't know about coming. <laughs> you're right, trip, and the. The great thing about what I would call the, the bottom-up approach to science and faith, that's a, that's a phrase from John Polkinghorne, where John used to talk about if you take the specific area of science or a particular discovery of science, and then you do your theology from that uh, into um, the more general theological, historical resources of the church, then people who are often turned off by theology will follow you. If you start with a top-down approach which says, let's lay the theological framework first, and then, by the way, we'll get to the little bits of science later, that's much more difficult to get an audience. And so... So I think that some uh, apologetic approaches are much better if they stress this bottom-up approach where you start with the 
very specific newsworthy area and then you connect it to the resources of the church of which there are many um, and many illuminating Mm -hmm. well one of the things that i thought you did really well in your book uh when i pray what does god do is show how um the kind of old scientific uh, worldview led to, you know, some twisting and turning and manipulation of the Christian tradition made us kind of misinterpret or ignore a lot of actual experience that human beings have because it didn't fit, but also how the new science opens up whole new possibilities. So when you think of, uh, I mean, it makes perfect sense why an astrophysicist and theologian would write a book on prayer. Um, but when you think of what uh, what are those experiences and parts of people's lives that they don't speak because they're, you know, embarrassed mm. in a scientifically shaped culture? Do you think we can, we should have permission to speak and share again when you think of what's opened up because of uh, new science? Very much so. Um, so my favorite disciple in the New Testament, not surprisingly, is Thomas. Thomas is the one who's not a doubter. Thomas is the one who actually asks the obvious questions. And um, I think too many churches and fellowships have uh, closed down, first of all, the asking of the obvious questions. And when it's linked to science, that operates with two other things. The first is that often we've not affirmed the place of the scientist within the local congregation. So we've not welcomed the scientist and said, um, your discipleship, your thinking, your questioning is helpful for the rest of us. We've often feared science and we've often worried about scientists and we've given this implicit kind of view that, that science is somehow evil and we shouldn't get involved in it. But I think the second thing is more to do with church leaders. And that is that too often it seems to me that church leaders have, um, from a default position when asked about science, have either been uh, silent about science, worried that they're going to be too controversial, or they've had a default position of negativity towards science as threat, as if all science is building a Tower of Babel in order to claim power with God. And the result is that if you have a church leader who is fearful or silent about science, there's a trickle-down effect in the congregation. Those who are scientists within the congregation suddenly feel well, my experience isn't really being affirmed here. Science must be, at the very least, neutral towards the gospel, if not against the gospel. Children and young people pick this up from an early age and think, well, science and the gospel must be in some kind of conflict. And uh, and this has been borne out by a little bit of the research that we've been doing here in Durham. Uh, we invited a number of very senior church leaders to be um, interviewed anonymously in an academic survey about their attitudes to science. Many declined to do that, although one bishop, uh, our researcher, arrived and said to the bishop, "Um, thank you very much for uh, agreeing to be interviewed on the subject of science, which point the bishop's face fell. And he said, science? He said, my PA told me it was an interview on silence. Uh, He then said, interesting enough, if it was about science, I wouldn't have granted the interview. Now, um, that uh, I don't think is true of all church leaders. But there's something true of some church leaders, which um, 
has that trickle-down effect. And what we do need, I think, is for an honest, joyful embrace of the questions, which says we're confident enough in the Christian understanding of the world that let's allow it to be questioned by science. And indeed, if we believe that science is God's gift, then let's be open to see how the Holy Spirit is working as much as in science as in the theological academy. And that's a bit of a culture change, I think, that we need to do on both sides of the Atlantic. Yeah, and one of the things that has struck me is how um, there is a lot of fear around engaging around the sciences, even though the person that uh, avoids it, they don't even understand the science anyway. That's the thing that I don't quite get. Um, Mm -hmm. I, I worked for eight years at a large mainline Protestant church in California when I was doing my PhD. And uh, you get this type of essentially uh, a kind of a a moralizing uh, deism as the uh, the operating piety of the people. And if you ask them why, like why you don't cultivate, uh, they're much more likely to borrow Eastern spiritual traditions than Western ones because the, if you use the word God is living and active, God automatically means some anthropomorphic projected entity. And if you tell them, uh, I don't know if that's very accurate and you don't even need a contemporary theologian to get over that. Like Aquinas was not like, uh, the, 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 uh, gray haired guy in the sky type of, uh, philosopher um they resist and then they go yeah but you know the big bang and evolution and i go would you know the mechanisms of evolution i mean like you know the survival um do you know what the big bet you realize like it was a minister that came up with idea right i don't know i mean just but you know science so there's probably not like a god around you know and so i think the question of prayer um and one of the things i really loved about the book and of already recommended it twice this week, is um, there are so many Christians who will sit and argue and wrestle with scientific ideas, reformulate their theological ideas uh, way before they actually cultivate the practices Jesus taught his disciples to do. Yes, that's right. And And I believe there's a form of existence that is at the heart of Christianity, one where you relate to a universe that the source of it is Abba, and that Abba is present and active. And one of the problems, I think, for, is, is that Christians are better Kantians um, than they are uh, Christ followers. And prayer is, not a, uh, prayer is not a secondary issue. It's actually how you cultivate the habits that Jesus walked around teaching his disciples to do. And I think that's why you end the book, right, with the Lord's Prayer again. To go, it wasn't this weird thing. He was actually inviting you into a way to center yourself and your community so that you encounter your neighbor, the world, and each other, shaped by a God who is love. I think that's right. And I think in my own very limited pastoral experience, um, those Christians who find themselves most plagued with difficulties in terms of intellectual uh, figuring it out, are often those Christians who don't practice the basics of prayer, of Bible reading, of fellowship with fellow Christians, of of talking to others about their faith. And often it's it's an organic relationship between that kind of uh, rhythm to life while then being able to ask questions Now, I think, Tripp, if I may say, there's another way to look at it, which is the opposite way, and that is when within churches we're not honest about some of the issues with prayer or Bible reading or witness. So the church, for instance, that will pray for someone and uh, with great hallelujahs will announce their healing 
But then when the person uh, has a reoccurrence of the cancer just a few months later, we'll paper that over. We'll not take time and say, look, we prayed for this person. There was some healing. Um, We then, this person got ill again. Can we at least talk about this? Now, there's no easy answer to a question like that. But often churches don't give the space simply to talk about it, uh, to name, as we would say, the elephant in the room, which is why did God seem to respond first time round, but then not lasting? And I think um, that openness of a congregation or the openness of a church leader or leadership team to to engage at the level of I'm going to continue to pray, but that doesn't mean that I can't have questions about it mm-hmm. um, is really important. And as I try and argue in the book, I think ultimately um, prayer is motivated by your understanding of God. If you have a corrupted view of God for whatever reason, your prayer life will eventually dry up. If um, you believe in the God who's represented in Scripture, in all of God's complexity, in all of God's um, action, then I think prayer is renewed. And um, um, But uh, yes, thank you. That's what I tried to say in the book, but you summarized it very well. Well, I, I, I just... I think that it gets at, or prayer kind of gets at one of the challenges in a, um, you know, like Charles Taylor gives a description of a secular age where the belief in God isn't required um, to have a full life, but also um, it's one, and then there's like a million expressions of what that looks like, um, is that there's a certain, uh, Protestants thought we handled doubts, questions, and challenges at an intellectual level and didn't realize how shaped we are by just the the cultural consciousness that's existing around religion and spirituality. And so uh, you can have philosophers, scientists, theologians wrestling with all sorts of ideas and coming up with creative ways of articulating uh, a religious tradition, um, but when the actual habits and patterns of your life are are built around a type of uh, reductive materialism, yes. uh, well, your values are shaped by um, a nation state uh, cons- and consumerism yes. and uh, th- those dreams and those narratives motivate our souls and the religious narratives are simply there to form us into kind of good citizens and good employees, then um, then it, it makes sense why people don't find anything going on in the church. And I feel like there's, uh, like as opposed to particular questions or particular topics being an issue, now it's how do you articulate faith in a post-religious age? How do you invite people in to a community that has rhythms, practices, and wrestles with those questions, but it is a rhythm and a community that shapes you such that the world you walk in is the one that the God who knows you and loves you completely has created? Absolutely. Um, John Drain um, has often said, you know, within Western Europe, there's a great uh, spiritual hunger. The trouble is that for many people, the last place they think they're going to get a meal is the Christian church. And there's something here which is about um, the basic hospitality or welcome in in the gospel um, is about about the both and. It's about the the patterns of life and the patterns of, of, of renewal and worship coupled with this really honest engagement with the culture, um, which um, to to enter a church shouldn't be entering a Christian bubble in order to get topped up with enough spiritual energy 
that you then go outside of the bubble back into the real world. The, the point about the local church, it seems to me, is the way that it acts as this um, place where the crossroads of, of Scripture and the crossroads of the world come together in sometimes a busy but very chaotic place, but where uh, the engagement is real. Um, and so um, in my prayer cycle, uh, day by day, in church on a Sunday, am I engaging with something more than just God bless mommy, God bless daddy? Mm -hmm. Am I engaging with uh, the refugee crisis? Am I engaging with Brexit? Am I engaging with um, uh, consumerism, as you mentioned earlier? And, and in a sermon, uh, in a biblical teaching, am I also um, being taken into the real world? Um, I remember after 9-11, here in the UK, we shared the, the grief and the shock that you did in, uh, uh, in the States. And for a couple of days during the week, although I worked in a theological college, I talked with colleagues about 9-11 and what had happened. On Sunday morning in my local church, uh, what I wanted to do was have the opportunity to put before God in the normal ways of prayer and Bible study and fellowship my grief and my shock at 9-11. And the preacher that morning, an ordained person, said, um, let's be silent for a moment uh, as we remember the victims of 9-11. And then he said, now that we've done that, let's turn to worship. And for the rest of the hour, nothing was said at all. Now that, for me, takes away the lifeblood of prayer and of engagement with the Scripture. So, yes, I agree, I agree completely, Trip. So um, the last question I have is one that uh, I'm, I'm real intrigued by, is in your work in the sciences, when someone... Who, when you interact with someone who didn't grow up in uh, a religious home, uh, is interested in how you hold those two identities, or or is interested in learning about the faith that animates and inspires your your work. Where is a helpful or positive place to begin um, when you know when their predisposition may be just shocked and unbelief yeah. that. Uh, that you're both an astrophysicist and a theologian. I, I think interesting enough to begin with, the many of my fellow peers at the level of research are not as shocked as most people think they sh they should be. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a great deal more openness uh, within astrophysics to, if not formalized belief, certainly belief in its highest spiritual power than is often represented in the press. But I think two answers to the question. The first is that I do think that there are some common questions um, where there's an immediate kind of uh, sharing of the ground. So um, why are the laws of physics so beautiful, intelligible, um, is one of the areas that many of my friends who aren't Christians will have honest questions about. We talked earlier about the Goldilocks enigma. I think that's another area. I think a sense of awe at the universe, a very emotional response, is something there. Um, now, I think, so there's a, there's a clutch of areas where the physics poses questions but I think I'd also want to say, and really importantly, that it's not just where I start, but it's also where I try at least to include, if not the end. And that is that my faith is built 
on the revelation of God in Jesus Christ. And I want to be authentic with my friends. So I don't want to give the impression that, um, you know, I'm going to argue for the existence of God on the basis of the physical laws or the Goldilocks enigma. If I'm going to be honest with them about where my faith comes from, it comes from the belief that God was in Jesus Christ. He became flesh. And the evidence that I have is in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And so um, now some will say, oh, hold on a moment. You've gone from science uh, with a discontinuity into all of this religious stuff. Um, And I have to say, well, if you see it as discontinuity, fair enough. But I need to say to you that my faith comes because of Jesus Christ. And that it's from that perspective that then the scientific questions make sense. This is what Tom Torrance, great old Scottish theologian, many years ago, talked about how revealed theology um, is the framework by which you then talk about natural theology. You've got to have the revelation first. God's the one who reaches out first in Jesus Christ and speaks about himself. It's from that perspective you then make sense of some of the scientific insights. Now, to be honest, sometimes uh, I don't get past the first little bit of science before we're cut off and we move on. Sometimes... um, Uh, Sometimes we do. I was speaking uh, to a very eminent um, neuroscientist uh, who'd written much on the theology of the mind and how religion was probably a construct of uh, evolutionary theory. And this person said to me, "Uh, what do you think of my work? (laughs) Which is always a, a difficult thing to respond to. Yeah, it's like, oh, it's about like asking if you think your kid's cute, you know? That's right, exactly. And uh, I had the courage because I knew the person a little to say, I think your characterization of religion is very good. But I said, I don't find it has anything to do with Christianity. Um, And the person looked rather shocked and said, why? And I said, because you don't deal with this sense that Christianity, like many other world faiths, makes a claim to be a revealed religion. But at the heart of what it's about is a God who acts, takes initiative, and inputs information into our understanding, which wouldn't be there simply uh, without that act of God. And, and that's where I think I, I try and be as authentic as I can. What I don't think we're, we should be as Christians is to simply water everything down to a common denominator where we say, well, actually, what you believe is exactly what I believe if we throw away this and this and this. Because I don't think true relationship comes through that. I think true relationship comes when we're real about our differences and we're honest about our differences and I encounter my Jewish friend or my Muslim friend or my Sikh friend uh, entirely from their perspective Um, and they encounter me entirely from my perspective. Mm -hmm. I think that's extremely helpful. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, I've had so much fun talking to you. I'm interested if there's any anything you anything else you want to mention, or uh, a lot of times people love to hear uh, where guests what are you know three books that have really shaped your own uh, life and thought that you like to recommend or give as gifts. <laughs> well, I, certainly, um, Trip. I've enjoyed this immensely. Thank you for your perceptiveness of questions and um, 
uh, you know, we could, uh, we've done probably a long time, haven't we? You want nearly an hour and a half, and it could have gone on. Um, I'm fascinated by your story, and I'll, I'll follow it up a little bit more. This is a, a really important ministry, it seems to me. So thank you uh, for doing it. Um, and um, uh, I'm you know, very happy if you want to talk again. Or um, That's a very interesting question. The first... Um, the first was a book by an Anglican evangelist called David Watson called Discipleship. It was a book that I read immediately after having become a Christian and um, was uh, a book about, uh, it was a, from an evangelical perspective, but with uh, a broad ecumenical horizon. Uh, on the nature of discipleship in the community, in some of the basics that we've talked about. Um, the second book was um, was a book by a Methodist theologian, a British Methodist theologian called Donald English, little known beyond the Methodist stable, uh, but it was his commentary on Mark's gospel in the uh, IVP series the bible speaks today and it was one of the first um encounters with really relevant biblical exposition uh, that i come across and that uh really um gave me a sort of grounding or love uh for for scripture um at the third the third book um, uh, was inevitably C.S. Lewis and Mere Christianity. Um, um, and the ability to make those connections between Christian faith um, and the world. Um, so those, those were the books. The, the science faith issues happened more in terms of talking to scientists who were Christians than the books that they had written. Mm -hmm. So before I started reading those books, it was, it was the, it was the symbol that someone could be a scientist and a Christian that had such a powerful effect on me. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Oh, yeah. I, it was so much fun. Let's talk again. Well, if you find yourself in England, drop me a line and come and see us in Durham. You'd be very welcome. Oh, that would be great. Great. Take care now. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.